We're going to talk about FDR and the New, and New Deal diplomacy today. And we are going to use the document book a little more. There are going to be a few times I want us to refer to it, so just have it ready. Um, and I wanted to show you all how lucky you are. Uh, not only did you have my book imposed upon you, my most recent book, but you guys got the hardcover. The uh, beautiful paperback just came out in bookstores wherever you are. Um, but you guys, since the paperback only came out after Gilda Lehrman ordered the books, you guys got the hardcover. So you guys got a really cool deal. Oh, it's all right. Just leave them on the front table with your names on. So we'll have plenty of time. They, and, and they might. This way you can just leave. Okay, cool. All right, so um, we are going to talk about FDR today. Uh, well, both lectures uh, on the New Deal and fascism and then on World War II uh, will we'll, we'll focus on FDR in many ways. How could you not focus on FDR? Uh, he, I think, appropriately is a larger than life figure in our teaching of the mid 20th century. Um, it's quite funny, um, if you talk to people, uh, for instance, uh, like my grandmother who just passed away at 101, uh, people of that generation, um, they will tell you that if they were in you know, their 20s growing up, as she was uh, when FDR was president, they thought he'd be president forever. They couldn't imagine anyone else being president. It's sort of like that principal who's just been there forever and doesn't go away. Um, he had been there so long, such a larger than life figure, and such a complex figure. Scholars like David Kennedy, who Wendy mentioned, have spent their entire career studying FDR, and they will tell you honestly over a glass of wine, they still don't understand him. An incredibly complex figure. Just a couple of the paradoxes uh, with FDR. Here is a man who came from one of the most privileged backgrounds of any figure to lead American society. Uh, he makes uh, Romney look like a church mouse in many ways, uh, though Romney probably has more offshore bank accounts. Um, uh, but yet, he was a president who showed a remarkable, I would say unparalleled ability to make poor, disenfranchised minorities feel that he felt their pain. His ability to convey empathy, compassion, uh, is almost unrivaled. And of course, there's a politics to it, uh, but there was a sincerity to it at some level. Right? All politicians do that. That was the Bill Clinton brilliance. That's the George W. Bush uh, effect as well. But he really, FDR did it on a scale that only any other figure has. And he did it without TV, and he did it without really being able to travel very much because of his uh, physical disability. Um, so incredibly privileged background, but incredible ability to connect with people so different from himself. Uh, no one has really been able to explain that magic in that sense, right? This is what I think Max Weber called in the late 19th century charisma. That's where the term comes from. Charisma was used by Weber to explain the role of a religious prophet. Why is it that certain figures like Jesus Christ are able to make people believe that they see beyond humanity? FDR is an appropriate use in a non-religious context for that term charisma. <coughs> Second paradox uh, about FDR, here is someone who manages to convince Americans that he is making the world better for them. But there is very little evidence on a day-to-day -day basis that he actually was. Most of his programs failed, at least in the short run. In the long run, you can argue they had major successes. You could argue something like the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, creates a basis right, for our natural infrastructure that we continue to live on. You could argue that the National Parks Administration, the National NRA, the Na National Reconstruction Act, the various agencies creating schools and art projects have enormous effects on society, but these are long-term effects. In the short term, most of the New Deal policies failed, and many of his early war policies were failures, and especially having the entire naval fleet of the Pacific at Pearl Harbor, right, on December 7th, 1941. Despite all these failures, he made people feel the world was getting better, and in fact, in the long run, it did. Was that his doing? Was that luck? Was that a convincing of people and making a reality out of persuasion? Very hard to explain. But it's very hard to call FDR's policies a blueprint for making policy in any other period. Right? It's another paradox with FDR. Third paradox. Here's a man who seemed to grasp, at least at some level, some of the most complicated concepts of economy, strategy, politics, science of his time. He's the man who initiates the Manhattan Project, gives the go-ahead for that. He's the man who actually comes up with the structure for the United Nations, 
right? Here is someone who actually understands banking reform at least enough to dive into it and put together a set of different agencies and actions for that. Nonetheless, there is no evidence, none at all, that FDR ever read a book in his life. No one has been able to document a single moment, even when he was in college, uh, that he ever read a book in his life. No one saw him read a book. He never referred to it. He read memos and documents, but there's no evidence that he did what we tell our students to do. Read a lot so you'll be smart. There's no evidence he ever did that, uh, which should be humbling for us. What was that background? So he uh, went to a privileged school, went to Groton and then went to Harvard, but at that time Harvard was more like a fraternity club and he was part of the fraternity scene at Harvard and then he got a law degree uh, and then went into the uh, legislature, the state legislature in New York, uh, was governor for one term. Back when he was, uh, and we'll talk a little about Hoover in a bit, um, when he ran against Hoover in uh, 1932, right, Herbert Hoover, who was the, I don't know, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs of his day, Herbert Hoover was the self-made boy child of, uh, an orphan, child of uh, West Branch, Iowa, right, who went on to Stanford, mostly on scholarship, and then made an international career for himself as a geologist uh, and traveled the world more than anyone else had. He was the businessman of his time. Then managed, as I mentioned yesterday, to be the only figure to come out of World War I looking better than when he went in. He was the person who organized food relief. He got businesses together and government together to feed Belgium and feed Russia. He revolutionized the office of the Department of Commerce, as we know it. Everyone assumed this was the right person to be president. He was the successful American dream of his time. Hoover said in 1932, when running against FDR, that this was an ignoramus one-term governor from a big state, which he was. He had been governor of New York State for one term. Right? And he was no intellectual in comparison to um, Herbert, Herbert Hoover. Um, so FDR is filled with paradoxes, uh, filled with paradoxes. And what I think is particularly interesting for us when we think about FDR as educators is the way in which FDR shows the importance of being able to adapt and being able to change. Because what I've just told you about, these three sets of contradictions with FDR, these are contradictions that are really inconsistencies, right? How can he be so privileged? How can he spend his weekends in Hyde Park hanging around with the Vanderbilts and others like that and then spend his weekdays talking to A. Philip Randolph, right, about Pullman car porters and African Americans? How can he do that? How can he be so concerned about the plight of civil rights but then sign the orders for the internment of 120,000 Japanese, right? So it is not that FDR follows a blueprint. It is not that FDR fits any management model. I always ask my uh, colleagues in business schools, if you've got all these wonderful management models, which one works for FDR? I never have an answer for that, right? Um, but he shows the ability to adapt and change. His failures, I will argue today in both lectures, were his successes too. And maybe the failures outrage the successes, maybe the successes outrage the failures. That's a, a judgment that you and your students can make. That's not a matter of fact. But there is no doubt that he accomplished a lot of things. And his accomplishments did not reflect the fact that he showed up any day for their office knowing exactly where he was going to come out. They came from his ability to adapt to the circumstances, to try new things, and his willingness to fail in order to succeed. I think that's so important. If you cannot fail, you cannot succeed. That's true in all parts of life, and I'd say that's the one historical law other than change that we can point to. Herbert Hoover's problem was that Herbert Hoover was smarter in an academic sense, but Herbert Hoover was unwilling to do things that Herbert Hoover did not believe would work. Herbert Hoover had a framework of thinking. He understood the economy, but when the Depression hit, he was unwilling to do things that he believed were untried, that he believed could not work. He was unwilling to experiment. He was unwilling to try new things out. FDR was, to a different extent. And I'd argue that one of the things that we talk about when we talk about leaders should not just be the brilliance and their ability to see forward, but their ability to adjust and try and fail and succeed. Megan? Um, so, I'm kind of a big admirer of Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. and Give 
enormous, an enormous amount. Um, and, and that is, uh, by the way, I, I, there are a lot of books on FDR, and, and so there's no perfect book on him either for that reason. But one area where I think Doris Kearns Goodman is very good is on the relationship between um, Eleanor and FDR. So no ordinary time. Uh, I think there are some problems. You'll see if you read that and hear me, there are differences on foreign policy that we'd have. But I think her account of Eleanor's importance is crucial. And what she, and I'll just steal her argument, there are at least three areas she sees Eleanor as being crucial. One is the obvious one. Uh, Eleanor comes actually from a privileged background, but is also surrounded by female activists. The way to think about Eleanor Roosevelt, I think, is to think about her as a second generation Jane Addams. Everyone knows who Jane Addams is, right? Also from a privileged background, right? Who becomes very involved professionally in defining a role for women in social reform. Eleanor Roosevelt is the next generation of that. I think of her as the Jane Addams of her time. And she brings those ideas into the FDR circle, right? And the men around FDR are not part of that environment. In the same way Jane Addams brings those ideas into progressive politics of John Dewey, Walter Lippmann, Bob La Follette, she does this for FDR. That's one way. Second thing, um, Eleanor, uh, and this is a point Doris Kearns Goodwin makes really well, Eleanor becomes FDR's eyes and ears because he can't travel as much. And her travels, especially in the late 30s, she brings back material to him. And what you all know, and I think is really important to recognize, is the higher a leader gets, the less often they get truthful information. You all recognize that, right? What happens? This actually happens on a small scale in all your schools, right? People tell the principal what the principal wants to hear, right? Everyone agree with that? That's what happens most often, right? People tell the dean what the dean wants to hear. People tell the mayor what the mayor wants to hear. People tell the president what the president wants to hear. Um, I, I've actually done a sort of uh, analysis of historians who go in and talk to presidents of the United States, and it's actually pathetic. They never. They never say anything the president doesn't want to hear. First of all, they're chosen because they're going to say what the president wants to hear. But it, it's hard to walk in. Think about when you go in the principal's office. Imagine going to the Oval Office and saying, you know, I'm sorry, Mr. President, but you just don't understand what's going on in Iraq. Let me tell you. You never say that, right? Because you know you won't be invited back. And you want to be invited back, right? Uh, Eleanor doesn't have that problem. Successful leaders, this is the Surrey rule of successful leadership, successful leaders have someone around them they trust who can tell them things they don't want to hear. Someone who's secure enough to do that. And in, in, in my life, that's my wife, and in FDR's life, that was his wife too. Um, but it can be, you know, people can set it up in different kinds of ways. Leaders get into trouble when they don't have that person, that person around them, right? Uh, and, and, and I think you can see all kinds of examples of that. Eleanor did that for FDR. Not only did she do that, she would hound him on issues that she cared about, and he couldn't tell her to go away, right? He couldn't. Well, in part, he didn't want to, right? And it's very hard for an advisor to do that. Colonel House did that a little bit for Wilson in 1915, 1916, and then it stops happening. They have a falling out, right? Um, so this, that's the third, that's the second area where Eleanor is really crucial. The third thing that I think is very important is that um, Eleanor helps to build his coalition. People understate what a fantastic politician she was. One of the reasons FDR was popular among less privileged is because of Eleanor. She was able to go out and talk to audiences. She was able to show that compassion as well. He was able to, in a sense, take credit for it. Um, but she was uh, probably one of the great politicians of the 20th century as well. And that realization came to me not from studying this period. It came when I was looking at the early Cold War and seeing how good a politician she was in the late 40s and getting people to sign on to the UN Declaration of Human Rights and getting people involved in those sorts of issues. She was a formidable force. Uh, and not just because she was Eleanor Roosevelt, because she knew how. You know, just as Johnson understood how to work people over, Eleanor Roosevelt understood how to, how to work people over. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's uh, all part of the composite FDR in a sense. What I want to talk about in this first uh, lecture today is, um, as I have in the title here, uh, Fascism and New Deal Diplomacy. And 
Uh, we can talk a lot about the Depression. Uh, we don't un unfortunately have uh, too much time, but I do want to begin by saying something about the Great Depression because uh, one of my personal hobby horses is to get people to understand the Depression. Uh, and it is one of the least understood topics among students. Um, in fact, when job candidates come to interview for positions as faculty, I often ask them, well, what do you think are the causes of the Great Depression? And more often than not, the smartest candidate cannot answer that question. Uh, because it's really hard to understand uh, what, the, what caused the Great Depression. It's a big debate. But there are two things we can say that are deeply relevant uh, for this. And I just want us to begin there. And we can come back to these issues in discussion if you want to talk about it more. Um, and I know uh, there are many sources you can go to that I can recommend to you. Uh, David Kennedy's work actually is one, some, some of the best work on, on the Great Depression. But there are two things that, that should be said uh, about the United States on the eve of the Great Depression and its relationship to the United States. The first is that the Great Depression was, above all else, a problem of deflation, not inflation. Deflation. We all think of inflation as a problem. That's the intuitive thing, right? Because inflation means that something costs more to us, right? So most of you are in an environment now where you're not getting big raises, right? So what would be really bad for you is if the cost of things started to go up. So they're saying that with drought, uh, the cost of food might go up next year. That's really bad for you. You have to worry about that, right? But actually, what's far worse than inflation is deflation. Right? Deflation is when prices go down, which if you have a lot of cash, looks good. But it is really bad for the economy because when prices go down, people stop producing. People stop producing items when, pri when, when prices go down. Production stops, and then people stop investing. And then the economy stops moving as people are unemployed. Right? Deflation, a deflationary spiral is very hard to work out of because in a deflationary spiral, the urge is to do less, not to do more. You buy less, you produce less, you get less in the economy, right? We're, we're, we're not in a deflationary spiral, but we have a credit crunch that echoes that, right? Banks are sitting on cash now. It's the opposite of the problem of 2008, right? Banks were giving out money, you know, they were giving mortgages to mariachi bands that you know, couldn't even show where they came from, right? Um, and then now they're doing the opposite. Now they're sitting on cash that they're not actually investing anywhere because they don't, don't, don't trust people, right? It's very hard to get a mortgage for people who actually are perfectly credit worthy today. That kind of deflationary spiral is what the United States and the world went into, right? Why, you might ask, did that happen? It happened for a classic reason, okay, which was that in the 1920s, and this will sound somewhat familiar, not entirely the same, in the 1920s, a lot of money had been spent in a variety of investments. The most famous one that people like Frederick Lewis Allen and others write about is property in Florida. Everyone was buying property in Florida, right? And these bubbles of different kinds, and there were many in many different areas, right, led people to come to the conclusion, in fact, that they had overinvested, they should contra contract their capital. That's what the crash on Wall Street's about, right? People are pulling their money out. And as money was pulled out, right, no one stepped in to lend more. And so you got the classic case of a bank run, where I know Russ is taking his money out of the bank, and then I see Sarah's taking hers out, so I say, I better get my money out too. Everyone starts pulling their money out. That's the first problem. Second problem connected to that is the legacy of World War I. That's the second point, right? Because coming out of World War I, all of the major economies in Europe owe money to whom? The United States. We are the net lender. They are net borrowers, right? They cannot make their payments to us. They begin to default. Their currencies become valueless, right? Everyone's seen the pictures of Weimar Germany where people are putting the money on their walls as, as um, wallpaper, right? Their money becomes valueless, and the United States refuses to send more money in. We do not, this is the Milton Friedman criticism, we do not actually expand the money supply sufficiently to put money in, right? So there's a credit contraction, and in fact, what then happens, right, is countries put up trade barriers and stop trading with one another. And so you get a period of high tariffs. So you have 
deflated currencies, a credit crunch, and then you have governments walling themselves off, right? including Herbert Hoover doing that. This is all very relevant, and it brings together, and, and we could, there are many more details to this. But what I've, what I've done, just for your own sense as teachers, is I've taken John Kenneth Galbraith's argument, Milton Friedman's, and Barry Eichengreen, who are three major people. But I've just sort of put them together. They differ on a lot of points. But these would be the three major points they agree on. Overspeculation is the Galbraith argument. Um, credit crunch and a tight, too tight money supply is the Milton Friedman argument. And the Eichen Green argument is the United States not acting as a lender of last resort. This is crucial because whether right or wrong, those are also the lessons that Americans take from this after World War II. The Bretton Woods system, which we'll talk about tomorrow, is created entirely to prevent those things from happening again. That's why we have an IMF, International Monetary Fund. That's why we have a World Bank. That's why the United States lends so much money after World War II to the very people we just destroyed, because of the fear of this same process happening again. By the way, anyone know the one country, the one country that paid off its World War I debts to the U.S.? There's only one. There's, Germany. Huh? Germany. Finland. 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 That's impressive that you guys knew that. Actually, a group of scholars often doesn't know that if you ask them. Okay. Why is this relevant for us? <coughs> well, this is crucially relevant because what I just described and the consequences of that are the explanation for both the New Deal and fascism. And what were the consequences? What were the context? And again, you know this. We can't spend too much time on it. Just want to put a few things in your mind. The consequences of what we just described were unemployment on a scale that is unimaginable for us today. And it might be worth saying this to your students. Could you imagine if pretty much one in five working Americans were unemployed? And by the way, one in five working Americans would mean uh, one in five breadwinners in families that only had one breadwinner, right? Not where one of two breadwinners is unemployed, but one of five breadwinners in families with only one breadwinner. Megan? Well, I actually did that with my class this year, and then I realized that for them, that is the situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that there are even more unemployed. So it was like a really weird sort of foot-in-mouth situation, <laughs> um, which, you know, that's fine. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's interesting. Onto, I, I, it's... <laughs> Yeah, we have a. <laughs> well, then the next question to ask would probably be, you know, uh, with no unemployment benefits, with, and you can go, I mean, so, yeah, I see your point. Um, how else would one put this? Um, well, they the, understood. I mean, you know, we talked about it for a long time, and they understood, like, and at this point, there wouldn't have been, you know, welfare. It would have right. The, the experience of bread lines. Uh, the experience, the experience, quite frankly, of, of going hungry during the day of large swaths of the population. Uh, it was also a time when uh, elderly people would die from malnutrition. Um, it would, el elderly people in American society and other societies did not have the support network, did not have perhaps the excess of benefits that they, that they get now. They didn't have that then. One other point that would be made uh, about this that's maybe the most important point and the, probably the biggest difference, at least from our world today, people in 1931, 32, the second and third year into this, Standard, non-radical thinkers really thought across the spectrum that perhaps capitalism was going to die. This was a true crisis of capitalism. You would have been seen as a strange person if you came in 1931-32 and showed up in a classroom at a university or a high school and said, capitalism is the wave of the future, it's all free markets. You would seem as crazy as someone who came in today and said, North Korea's got the model for us, autarky control in the center, give all the food to the military, right? It would seem as strange as that, right? People, mainstream figures in the U.S., Europe, and elsewhere, believed that capitalism was truly in crisis, right? Believed it was truly in crisis. And fascism and the New Deal were responses to that. I will argue that if you want to understand this period in terms of its foreign policy and domestic policy, you must see the differences between fascism and the New Deal, but you must also see their twin origins, that they grow out of the same problems. And what the problems of the Depression did is create an imperative for policy change in all the major societies that we talked about yesterday, the United States, Great Britain, Germany, Russia, 
And it also created an imperative and opportunity to do things differently. And you should think about fascists and the New Dealers around FDR as great experimentalists. Um, experimentalists with different sets of values, with different results. But they grow out of the same moment. And, and I think this is an important historical point that the same circumstances can produce different outcomes in different societies. So let's talk um, a little bit about that. Between 1931 and 1933, three major markers of change occurred. In Japan and East Asia, the newly empowered Empire of Japan, which had been undergoing a series of major reforms, recognized, uh, as it long had, but really, I think, made a point of recognizing and articulating that in a world of economic crisis, of depleting resources, world of deflation, resources needed to be held and the strong productive powers needed to grab those resources. And in 1931, in what was the great crisis, great foreign policy crisis of the early 30s that we often just brush over as teachers and shouldn't and hopefully never will after this day, the Japanese invade Manchuria and take control of Manchuria in 1931. Secretary of State Henry Stimson, who will turn up again as Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt's Secretary of War, Secretary of State Henry Stimson, the kind of Robert Gates of his age, uh, wants Herbert Hoover to condemn Japanese action, and he wants even to consider through the League of Nations military retaliation. Herbert Hoover refuses to do this. And a world in depression, the last thing the United States and Great Britain and France want to do is actually get into a war with Japan at this moment. This is absolutely huge because in seizing Manchuria, Japan gets the lion's share of East Asian coal and iron ore. And for an economy of the early 20th century, an industrializing economy, that is the gold. Right? I tell my students there are two ways in which geography largely conditions the outcomes of mid-20th century politics. And they are in two places. One is called Manchuria and one is called the Rhineland in Europe. Right? What do they both have? Coal and iron. What is the problem? There's a lot of it in one place. Whoever gets a lot of it is very powerful. Right? That's exactly what Hitler was thinking in remilitarizing the Rhineland and taking the Rhineland. That's exactly what the Japanese were doing here. The Japanese take control of Manchuria, an area that had been disputed between them and Russia and China, and to some extent the United States and Great Britain for 30 years. They take full control of it and they begin to harness those resources even more than that. They set up a permanent paramilitary force called the Kwantung Army. The Kwantung Army in Manchuria. This is set up as a separate Japanese army, not under the direct control of the standard Japanese army, designed to rule, to colonize, and to ethnically cleanse this area. And they begin that process. Why do they want to ethnically cleanse the area? Well, they have racial issues, of course, with the Chinese, and later with the Koreans as well. Actually, the same earlier with the Koreans and carrying forward. But beyond that, um, they want to make the most efficient use of this territory. And there are too many Chinese in the way. So they want to get the Chinese out. They want to use the Chinese as laborers. In Korea, of course, they use Koreans as sex laborers of different kinds. Uh, they begin to harness what they see as occupation policies that will be necessary for maximizing their power in a world of depleting resources and struggle. And the Japanese argument is a very simple argument. There are not enough resources. The resources are getting more and more tight. It's getting more competitive. We need to grab our rightful place in the sun. And the Chinese and the Koreans are in the way right now. This uh, sounds a little bit like late, late in Rome. Absolutely. That's exactly where I'm going with this bill. That's, no, that's, 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 that's exactly right. That's exactly the argument Hitler, Hitler will make. Uh, and that's, that's what I will argue is one of the reasons we call these fascist regimes, even though they have so many other differences. That would be one of the fundamental arguments, uh, I, I think, would, in how we would define fascism. The important point here is not only that they do this, that they get away with it. There's almost no reaction. In fact, Henry Stimson, when he cannot get President Hoover to react to this, he at least wants the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City, a major think tank and meeting point for international diplomats, to not allow the Japanese to show up. And they refuse to do that either. 
right? Not because these are weak-willed political leaders in the U.S. and Europe, but because in a time of depression, the last thing they want to do is have a war with Japan. About the same time, Adolf Hitler uh, becomes chancellor of Germany. And here you have President Hindenburg, who you'll remember uh, from World War I, uh, one of the leaders of Germany, military leaders of Germany, who lost the war and then claimed he hadn't lost the war, right? So one of the liars of German leadership at the time, uh, appointing Hitler as chancellor. The Nazi party had been a fringe party in Germany in the 1920s. Um, they stage an attempted coup in Munich in 1923. They fail. Hitler gets put in jail. Um, he has a number of wealthy supporters, and he's allowed out of jail, uh, but largely because they're seen as a fringe movement. They're seen as a pain. They're seen as perhaps a local threat to the security of Jews, but people don't always worry so much about that. They are not seen as a viable political party until the Depression, until the Depression. What the Depression does is it discredits the Social Democrats, and you should all know Germany has the largest socialist party in Europe before the Russian Revolution, and it has one of the most vibrant socialist parties in Europe after World War I, but they are discredited because of the problems of the German economy during the Depression. The problems of having a currency that becomes worthless, the problems of not having access to basic imported materials during this period and the humiliation Germans feel at becoming so weak so fast after the, a war they felt they really didn't lose. The stab in the back myth that Hitler and others put forth is that Germany's suffering in the Depression is not Germany's fault. It's the fault of the World War I settlement, which was negotiated by the standard political parties. And as people in Germany suffer, they believe that argument, right? When people suffer, they look to blame someone, right? They look to blame someone. Russ? When did historians or any, did anyone in the, in the 30s attempt to articulate a, a challenge to the stab in the back theory? People were doing it all the time. Um, yeah, yeah the, 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 the challenge was there uh, in Germany as well. Uh, but people didn't want to believe it. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit at the, at the Ransom Center when I talk about um, Henry Kissinger's background, because he actually came, comes of age in Germany at exactly this moment, and I think that that's how you have to actually understand him. But I think what's really important is I think that intellectually, most Germans, even in 1937, 38, didn't believe the stab in the back, intellectually. But emotionally, they wanted to believe it. Emotionally, they wanted to believe it. And, and we shouldn't think this is just other societies. It's an extreme form of what we see in our own society, right? People want to say the problems in their lives are there because it's someone else's doing. And they want to blame someone for it, right? Just talk to people in any small town where the local hardware store can't compete with Walmart, right? They want to blame someone for that, right? I don't want to defend Walmart, but I also want to say I don't think, and I don't think it's anyone's fault that the local hardware store is having trouble competing. The world has changed, right? We might wish it hadn't, right? But I don't think any Democrat or Republican has made that the case, right? I, I forgot your first name. So. I, I was just okay. I, th I thought you wanted to say, <laughs> what's your first name? I keep, Melissa. Melissa, I'm sorry. I keep wanting to call both of you Megan, but she's Megan, you're Melissa. Okay. Other, I saw another question over here. All right, so Hitler also um, is part of a party that does one other thing that's really important. He not only helps to further the stab in the back myth that people might know is wrong but want to believe. He also promises that the solution for Germans is for them to be strong again. He offers a solution. And there have been, as you can imagine and know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of detailed studies of Nazism in local areas, Nazism on a national level. What I think is the one consensus that people come to is people were drawn to the Nazi party during a period of depression, during a period of difficulty, during a period when their families were breaking up, when they didn't know what to do, because the Nazi party gave them pride, made them feel powerful again, made them feel good to be German again. And that, of course, is connected directly to the anti-Semitism, right? Because part of feeling good to be German 
was not to be a cosmopolitan Jew, right? And the studies, especially the local studies, they were wonderful local studies of almost every major town that went Nazi in the, in the um, early 1930s in terms of its voting patterns, it's that. It's not that people come away saying, I think the Nazis have a solution, not coming away saying, I think they know exactly what to do, but they make me feel that I have meaning. They've made me feel proud to be a German again. And the Nazis were brilliant at this. They put on festivals. They gave out beer at their, uh, their gatherings. Hitler used to come in with a plane. Yesterday, Marsha talked about LBJ in the helicopter. Hitler did the same thing with the airplane. He would fly into these towns with an airplane, right, and say, look what Germans can do. We can be strong again. Uh, and people were drawn to that, and the other parties were discredited. Now, Hitler never got a majority of the vote, fairly, in Germany. In 1932, there are two elections because governments are formed. The way the system works, uh, Hindenburg is the president, and there is an, a, a chancellor uh, chosen from the Reichstag, from the parties in the Reichstag. Generally, the party with the majority or the plurality gets to make a government. Throughout the late 20s and early 30s, there are plurality parties. No one party gets a majority. And so what happens is there are multiple parties Hindenburg will go and ask the leader of a particular party to try to form a coalition government where you try to get 50% of the vote. <coughs> Time and again, he doesn't go to Hitler. He doesn't go to Hitler. He goes through one traditional German aristocrat after another. And their governments fall. Their governments fail until in March of 1933, turns to Adolf Hitler. And this is the moment uh, you're looking at here. Just to flash forward for a second, uh, and we'll talk about uh, how this happens. Uh, the views of Hitler that we have today are not the views that people would have had even in the United States in 1936-37. You have in your um, volume here, and we'll turn to it in a second, an account that, that actually I found in, um, in the diary of Hamilton Fish Armstrong, who was a major American foreign policy person who went as the editor of Foreign Affairs magazine and interviewed Hitler in 1933. And he's horrified by Hitler. Uh, and we'll read that in a second. Uh, but what you should also note is he's making it clear that he doesn't think everyone is horrified by Hitler. Joachim Fest, a great German historian and biographer of Hitler, writes that if Hitler had died in 1936 or 37, let's say he'd been hit by a car or died of a heart attack, people probably would have said he was one of the great men of the 1930s. Dachau had been opened. There had been some people killed in concentration camps. The numbers are relatively small and largely because he mobilizes the economy, militarizes things, and forces production from the center, the German economy recovers faster than most of those around it, right? And he's quite popular by 36, 37. Uh, that's, that should be humbling for all of us, about how you don't know where you are until you're at the end of the story, really. Let's actually read for a second um, what Armstrong writes. This is on page um, 56. And Hamilton Fish Armstrong was the um, editor of Foreign Affairs magazine, which was a major journal produced by the sort of intellectual leaders of American foreign policy thinking in New York, the Council on Foreign Relations. And he went around in 1933, and he kept a nice diary of this, thankfully, meeting with leaders of Europe. And I want to... Um, Turn to page 60 to 61 here. I'll read it for you. Actually, let's start. I'm sorry. Let's start from the, let's start from the beginning. Hitler's office at the chancellery was filled with flowering plants left from his birthday a week earlier. He greeted me with a slight bow from the waist. He was not in uniform, and there was no Nazi salute. Instead, he shook hands and motioned me to a low round table on which reposed a pad with some headings in pencil. Evidently, he was prepared with a speech. I sat opposite him with Ernest, Ernst Hof, Hofsteingel, who was the interlocutor for them, on one side and Hans Thompson on the other. Thompson and I had already met. He had been German consul in Naples under the fascists and had come easily to the belief that a similar movement in Germany was, as he put it, obligatory. He and Putzi, that's uh, Ernst Hofsteingel, uh, People of uh, New York aristocrats of that time used these kind of strange names for each other, Putsi and whatever. Uh, were to serve as interpreters each, I suppose, to watch the other. Neither fulfilled the assignment very well. For when I asked an uncomfortable question, both were reluctant to incur Hitler's displeasure. 
by putting it to him in German. Remember what I said about not wanting to tell the leader what the leader doesn't want to hear. They undoubtedly knew, besides, that Hitler's format did not provide for interruptions. Let's go to page 57, second full paragraph. Without preliminary then, Hitler began addressing me. He spoke quietly. Two or three times, however, he seemed to lose control. A few words at the start of a sentence about some indignity inflicted on Germany would suddenly carry his voice up to the breaking point. His eyes flashed, and a wisp of hair fell down over his left eye in the way the whole world knew. The rocket went up with a whiz. Then there was a splutter. He smoothed his hair and went on again comparatively calmly. He started with a formal statement that Germany was for peace, noting that he had emphasized this in his very first pronouncements after coming into office. How could it be otherwise, he said, in a country which had eight million men out of work? This did not carry conviction, for I had learned that statesmen, statesmen always say their country wanted peace, and to prove it cited equally well either prosperity or bad times and unemployment. He went at length into the iniquities of Versailles, but said that the moment had not come to rectify them. We must look ahead. We must make a new Germany. We must consolidate our strength. All this was conventional stuff. The Polish frontier, he went on, was unmuglich, means not capable, not good, und unertraglich, not available for us, not appropriate, impossible and intolerable, and to accept it permanently was unthinkable, absolute undenkbar. How would Americans feel, he asked, if they were bound by a foreign diktat that prevented them from having adequate troops while their neighbor, Mexico, which bore the same cultural relationship to the United States as Poland did to Germany, had enormous armaments, was increasing those armaments and threatening the American frontier. Poland holds a naked knife in her teeth, he said, clenching his teeth in demonstration and looks at us menacingly, glaring at me though I were a regiment of Polish soldiers. I'm sorry, it, 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 of course it is. Uh, let's move on. Uh, page 59, second full paragraph. We are armed today, said Hitler, with spears, bows, and arrows, and swords. Does that condition represent a danger to the peace of the world? Or does the danger of war come from the vast arms possessed by Poland? The answer he concluded was obvious, and the sooner the world recognized it, the better for the world. He did not say for Germany, but for the world. We have waited months and years for justice. To get it, we must rearm. We cannot and will not wait longer. The sin quanon of any agreement with Germany will join, that Germany will join must be, at the very min minimum, equality of arms. Further generalizations followed, during which I found a chance to put a question to him about the national boycott of Jewish businesses on April 1st, which had caused tremendous repercussions abroad. Would it be repeated? The world, I said, was following the campaign against German Jews with intense concern. Actually, I had taken his omission of any reference to the Jewish question as perhaps indicating, though in a, in a negative way, that he might, after all, take some slight interest in foreign opinion. Let's go on. Next paragraph. Hitler accompanied me to the door. A great compliment Putzi told me afterwards. To pay him back for giving me a lecture, rather than accepting a give and take of ideas, I thanked him for addressing me alone, when usually he addressed 60 millions. Let me go to the last paragraph. Second, actually, second to last paragraph, page 60. It was not only the wreck of civilization then that I had observed. It carried the threat of disaster for all the world. Yet as I left Berlin, I speculated whether I might not be wrong, whether the current passions and violence might not be phenomena of a first era of revolutionary fervor only. Was there not the ghost of a chance that Hitler might modify the means he threatened to use to reach his promised goal? The German spirit had been purged, at least in part, of its pent-up store of hate and envy. Full legal and moral equality had been declared, and the material evidence to support it would mount rapidly. Let's go on to the last paragraph. Nothing that I had heard or seen in Berlin really seemed to me to justify such a hope. And even if the next to impossible did happen, was it conceivable that the world would accept it in good faith? Would France believe in a new Hitler? Hitler had taken the German fortress, and citizens who had now shout, not shouted Sieg Heil had been beaten to their knees. In the little book which I wrote in the next few weeks, I questioned most pessimistically both the hope that Hitler armed would draw back from the ultimate test of wills and the thesis of many that his reign would prove to be a flash in the pan. A people had, in, a sober, in sober and awful truth, disappeared. I could not see the possibility of their re rebirth as a part of Western civilization under Hitler or the possibility of their resurgence against him. This is a great example of how diaries are really helpful. This is written at the time. It's prescient, 
uh, uh, but it's written at the time. And what's striking is, I think, what one of the most important points is, is that um, Hitler is, is, in a sense, uh, insane, but in a sense, he's coldly rational, too. He has reasons for what he's doing, right, that Armstrong finds offensive, but that also resonate with the times that he's in, right? And that is a reflection on the Depression. That is a reflection on what that did to German society. Same is true in a very different way for Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt uh, came into office in 1933, and at that time the inauguration of the president occurred in March, at a time when the American economy was only sinking, when things only seemed to be getting worse. And Franklin Roosevelt also was a figure who uh, was sphinx-like. People did not know what he was going to do. In fact, he ran for office on what economic policy? Policy of balancing the budget, not spending more money. This is a famous picture, actually, I believe it was in the New Yorker. I'm not sure of the original provenance. I think it was the New Yorker, of uh, FDR and Hoover driving as the outgoing president and incoming president traditionally do from the White House to Capitol Hill on Inauguration Day. Um, both men recount later that not a word was spoken. Not a word was spoken, right? From all we can tell, George W. Bush and uh, Barack Obama had a great time in the, in the vehicle. They were willing to, from what I've heard, they wanted to just keep circling around and never get out, right? They were willing to hang out, you know, have a little fun. Uh, these guys didn't want didn't to talk. Hoover saw FDR as not only an ignoramus, but a threat to the sanctity of American democracy, what we believed in. He was a demagogue. Hoover believed. And FDR believed that Hoover was the old politics, the great economic man of his time who couldn't solve the problems of the Depression. And as Hitler justified his leadership on the changed world and the problems of resources, as the Japanese justified their expansion, FDR justified doing things that hadn't been done before in the same terms. His inaugural address, right? There is nothing to fear but fear of self. The fear he's talking about is not just the fear of economic downturn, it's the fear of doing new things, the fear of trying things that hadn't been tried before. Both fascism in its Japanese and German incarnations and the New Deal in its FDR inc incarnations had three elements to them. They were internationalist. They were reacting to imperialism. And war was a part of their policies in different ways. And we'll just spend a couple minutes on each of these points. And it'll help us to define what these elements were. And then in the next lecture after break, we'll talk about World War II and we'll see some of this um, in action. The Nazi movement in particular and the Japanese movement was internationalist. As you heard in what um, Armstrong recounts, internationalist in the presumption, in the presumption that the world was a world that was too small and too competitive for people not to be seeking resources and land for themselves. Bill referred to this. This is the Lebensraum claim. The claim that there must be more. There must be more access to land, more access to space, more access to the resources that are needed. It was an international world of social Darwinism, of survival of the fittest of struggles against races. You hear that in what Armstrong recounts of Hitler's discussion, right? The Poles are the problem because the Poles occupy land the Germans want. It seems absurd, as Earl says, that the Poles would be so threatening to the Germans, but the problem is they occupy the eastern lands that the Germans feel they need. They occupy the space that the Germans feel they need. It is a competitive social Darwinist world, and only the survival of the strongest races is possible through the expansion of their power. It is an international world of conflict, an international world of militarization. The New Deal, FDR's New Deal, sees the same problem but turns in a different direction. And I think this is part of what's being mocked here in FDR. FDR also sees the world moving toward hypernationalism, moving toward conflict. And FDR believes that instead of winning the conflict, the United States must be prepared to defuse conflict. The United States must make itself the chief mediator rather than the chief fighter. And this is where FDR's background is most clear in his actions. Because the one thing that comes through in FDR's lifetime and again is that in almost every environment he was in, 
he found a way to charm the people around him. This was a man who believed in his inordinate ability to win people over, right? In his inordinate ability, and he, and he could do that. Famously, he would meet with people who had totally opposite points of view, and they would come out of the meeting thinking he agreed with both of them, right? Keynes meets with him, and Keynes leaves thinking, oh, FDR has been converted to Keynesianism, and FDR was not converted to <laughs> Keynesian. Keynes' opponents meet with him and think he's been converted. No. Winston Churchill says, I never really understood why FDR could agree with me and Stalin at the same time on many key issues. But he did. Right? He believed he could win people over. So whereas Hitler thinks, whereas fascism argues the problem of international competition is that the Germans aren't strong enough and they've got to be stronger, FDR argues the United States has to play more of a role, more of a role mediating, more of a role bringing people together. He starts this at home. This is at home and abroad. Corporatism is a phrase that a scholar has used to describe this. And it's actually a continuity from Hoover to FDR. FDR just personalizes it. Corporatism is the belief that you solve problems not by creating adversarial relationships between labor and business and government, but actually getting everyone to work together, getting everyone to cooperate together. And if you look at the New Deal agencies, they were designed to do that. They were designed to bring groups together. Get the business leaders, get the labor leaders, get the racial group leaders, get the local leaders, get the government leaders all together and make them work together. Figure out a compromise solution for them. And FDR also believes that this has to begin for foreign policy in our backyard. We need to make sure if there's conflict in the world, in a world of depression, that the conflict is contained and not in our backyard. So he initiates again a policy that Hoover had started, but FDR pushes forward, the good neighbor policy. Withdraws U.S. soldiers from Haiti in 1933. <coughs> in an extraordinary act, in 1936, despite his disability, goes to Buenos Aires and attends the Inter-American Conference for Peace. It was a major moment. Latin Americans around the region commented on this. He came down, went to Argentina, and made a strong case for peaceful cooperation and a strong case that the United States would not intervene in the region in the way it had under TR and Wilson and Hoover. That American intervention would be reduced in the region, that the United States would be a good neighbor. He sketched out a vision that echoed some of the things that Hitler was saying, but echoed them in a very different way. If Hitler said the Germans had to be strong to protect Western civilization, to protect the essence of value in Europe that was being lost by the Poles and others, FDR said that the protection of Western civilization had to be about cooperation between the United States and its neighbors. Both were talking about protecting civilization that they saw imperiled, but both argued to do it differently. Now, as German commentators would, of course, point out, the United States was in a position of so much more strength relative to its Latin American neighbors, it's easier to say that. And the Germans were not in that position. But that, nonetheless, was the reality of the circumstance. The good neighbor policy would later influence, of course, John F. Kennedy's efforts with the Alliance for Progress in the 1960s to do this again with Latin, Latin America. Let's talk about the issue of imperialism. Both, both the New Deal and fascism, both were anti-imperialist in the sense that both were against the traditional empires that had been built by the European powers. For the Germans and the Japanese, the problem was that the British, the French, and others from Europe had taken all the good land, right? The Japanese, when criticized about Manchuria, what do you think they said? They said, oh, diplomat from London, you're angry that we're in Manchuria. Well, last I looked, you were in Hong Kong, right? Oh, diplomat from Portugal, upset at us. Well, you are in Macau, right? The treaty ports, the inroads that the imperial powers had made in Asia, right? The Japanese had been too late to the game, they felt. They felt left out. The Germans, the same thing. They were anti-imperialist because they believed that the empires created by the Europeans disadvantaged them. And they were not wrong in that sense. Same thing with FDR. FDR was deeply anti-imperialist, deeply opposed to the empires of Europe because he believed that they spawned the problems of radicalism. That it was the existence of empire that justified what he saw as radical behavior by local figures. He believed, FDR did, that actually a place of empire, more appropriate, friendly relations would provide for a bulwark against radicalism, against revolution. <coughs> so very early on, 
He talks in the mid-1930s about not supporting the British in India, not supporting the French in Vietnam, and pretty consistently says negative things about those empires. Doesn't mean he's saying we should go out and force them out. And doesn't mean he's saying the United States shouldn't pursue its own expansionist interests. But he's against empire in its traditional sense. That's the point I'm making here. He's not optimistic about that. This will be important when we talk about the Atlantic Charter. And in fact, he puts his money where his mouth is, FDR does. It's also good in a econo- period of economic difficulty. <coughs> as the Germans are arguing for Lebensraum as an alternative to empire, as the Japanese are arguing that they're building their own greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere as an alternative to the European empires, um, FDR pursues the Tidings McDuffie Act in 1934, which actually pledges for the United States to leave the Philippines in 1944. He's pulled out of Haiti. He's going to pull out of the Philippines. He's not only arguing against empire, he's at least removing the obvious elements of American behavior that could be seen as another version of empire. He still wants markets. He's still pursuing interests. He still wants to protect American property, but he doesn't want to see traditional empire. And then there's the question, of course, of uh, war. FDR's solution to the problem of empire is to create a trustee system, a trusteeship system, right? The solution that the fascists have to empire is actually to make war an alternative, an alternative to what they see as the long-term stagnation of empires in the world or the chaos of local revolutions. Their argument is that pursuing through policies of military expansion, they can build alternatives to the empires that exist. They can build new forms of prosperity in regions that have not been prosperous before. In fact, it's impossible, impossible to think about fascism without thinking about warfare. The argument historians make today is that warfare was not a policy for Hitler. Warfare was not a policy for the Japanese leadership. It was their identity. They defined themselves that way. They defined themselves that way. And one thing our students might not know, and it's probably good in the sense they don't know it, is there's all kinds of literature in the 20s and 30s about the virtues of violence, about violence as a form of authenticity. Some of this literature comes back even in our own society in the 1960s, right? So you are showing your authenticity. You are showing your loyalty. You are showing who you are through your violent behavior. And in a time when many male figures in societies have lost their jobs and feel dis- uh, separated, feel unlocated, feel they've lost their position, violence is a way of asserting their masculinity as well. Right? It is impossible to think about a peaceful Nazi regime. Militarism was built into the pageantry. Militarism was built into the way they talked about themselves. Same thing with the Japanese regime in this period. Militarization was not just an alternative to empire and an alternative to the old politics. It was part of their political identity. And the Depression gave that more currency, right? Because other leaders seemed weak. The opposite is true for the New Deal. It was the presence of this, the presence of what Armstrong was talking about. Notice he doesn't say we should go in and do anything about it that made many Americans, people like Charles Lindbergh and others, believe that this was a dangerous moment when we could find ourselves in a major war again, and we should do everything we can to keep ourselves out, to keep ourselves out. And it is in that context that you have to understand the neutrality acts that now seem so pig-headed, but were so important to this period. There are a whole series, at just this time, of investigations in the U.S. about how War manufacturers and others got us into World War I. How bad that was. Look, we fought that war and now we're in depression. Look at what's happened. And look what's happening around the world. We shouldn't be fooled again. Let's not get stuck in war again. Let's not have to deal with those crazies in Europe. Let them handle their problems. Let us handle our own. And FDR played to that. 1936, you look at his campaign, it's all about that. I'll keep us out of these troubles. I'll take care of our business at home. And the Neutrality Acts of 35, 36, 37 are efforts by the American Congress with great public support on both sides of the political spectrum to actually make sure that the United States does not fail to be neutral as it had failed to be neutral under Woodrow Wilson, right? The 1935 Act prohibits the sale, the sale or transportation of all war munitions to belligerents. No war munitions will be sold. This is an effort to avoid what happened with the Lusitania. No armed cartridges on ships. 
The neutrality of 1936 prohibits all loans to belligerents. Sorry, you can't loan to them any longer. The Neutrality Act of 1937 allows belligerents not even credit in the United States. They can only have cash and carry. No credit. So if they want to buy something of ours, food or anything that's related, has any direct war relationship, uniforms, cotton, they have to pay cash. We will not lend them credit. We will not attach ourselves to them long term. Right? We will not attach ourselves to them long term. These are all direct reactions to World War I. All direct reactions to prevent the same thing from happening again. Right? All efforts to do that. The Lend-Lease Act of 1941 is a crafty move by FDR to play it both ways. What the Lend-Lease Act says is that the United States will actually lease out some equipment to those we prefer, the British in particular, but also the Russians. But we're still not going to sell it to them. We're still not going to sell it to them. We're going to lend it to them. They've got to give it back to us, right? Which means we are not dependent upon their economies. There's no loan. There's no financial transaction. Our currency is not tied to theirs. And by the way, Lend-Lease works nicely. This is what makes it crafty for FDR, right? Because it actually gives a reason for people to produce more. This problem is trying to get more produced, right? He's trying to get more made, right? He's trying to stimulate the economy. He gets it both ways, right? So he can actually keep a bit of a market overseas, but at the same time, he doesn't have to tie the United States to it. He can help the British. He's not really being neutral, but he's trying to stay neutral in the political realm while economically <coughs> helping them out. You have to understand appeasement in these terms. This is the point I want to really close on. We look back on this period and we make fun, not just students, scholars. Politicians have done this consistently, right? The problem of the 1930s was that the good guys let the bad guys, right, continue to do bad things, right? The bullies were in the hallway and in the school garden, right? And no one wanted to do anything about it. And what happened was the bullies just got stronger and stronger, right? And the good guys just let that happen. That is such a bad argument. That is so wrong, right? Because the problem was not that the good guys were too weak and too soft and too wimpy. The problem was that the good guys saw what the bad guys were doing and the good guys wanted to find an alternative because they didn't feel that they could deal with their problems at home if they were going to deal with these problems over there. And they felt that from World War I, their efforts to deal with problems over there had not solved those problems but only made them worse. Appeasement was a strategy of buying time. Appeasement was a strategy of focusing on other priorities. Appeasement was a strategy of waiting intentionally until the United States was actually in a better position to fight if it was going to fight. We look back on it now and say the United States should have acted earlier. Of course Hitler could have been stopped in 1936, right, when he rearms the Rhineland. It was, would have been very easy to stop him then. He could have probably been stopped in 38 at the time of the Munich Conference, right? But the United States was not in a position to do that, and FDR understood that. FDR understood that. It was not in a position to do it and solve its problems at home. FDR didn't get that from reading a book. He didn't get that from some formula of politics. I think he got that from feeling the country, feeling where the country was. Appeasement was a strategy he pursued. Same for Great Britain, by the way. The British strategy for a century had been that they have an empire that's too large. They can't defend it all. So you give pieces of it away to protect the things you really care about. Right? Appeasement was a good strategy for a while. Right? The lesson Americans have learned improperly is that appeasement is always bad. That's wrong. Sometimes you do appease. I tell, I've even said this in foreign policy circles in Washington. Sometimes, Aren't you a parent? Haven't you actually raised kids? If you have, you know you appease much more often <laughs> than not, right? If I didn't appease 95% of the time in my house, I wouldn't be in my house anymore, right? You appease most of the time until you're ready to fight for something you really care about. And that is what FDR, I think, was trying to do. That's how I think he would have articulated it. These are very different societies, the United States and Germany and Japan. But they are societies made of the moment. And these are movements that are made of the moment. And the last point I'll make is I think what we can learn from this is not only the story of the leadership and the dilemmas of the time, we can also learn how <coughs> transformations in societies and economies have disruptive effects, and disruptive effects that are felt in different ways. I think, and when we get to Friday, I'll talk about this, 
I think similar things are happening in the Arab world today. And there's going to be a different kind of reverberation in Egypt than there is in Syria, than there is in Russia. But we're living through another transformative moment, another moment of difficulty in this way. And societies are seeking and groping to cope with it in different ways. And we, as the United States, need to figure out how we want to cope with these issues. But we also have to be ready to pursue different kinds of policies with different areas, right? Because we're not going to be able to solve all these problems, just as FDR didn't solve all of these problems. What he did well, I think, was that he prepared the United States to be in a better position when it did have to fight than it was before. And he also, he also, for all of his inconsistencies, for all of the shortcomings, and we'll talk about that with regard to the Japanese uh, when we talk about World War II, for all of his shortcomings, he avoided the worst urges. What you can say about the fascist movements is that they reflected serious difficulties in their societies. They had legitimate gripes, but they chose the worst, most brutal, most violent solutions to those problems. And FDR deserves credit, I think, for making better choices, not necessarily the best choices. Bill? In, in the context of this discussion, could you talk about the timing of the oil embargo? Yeah, so, uh, so FDR, uh, this is a great question, Bill. So FDR, unlike Hoover, uh, he really wants to stop the Japanese. Uh, there are a couple of reasons uh, why this is the case. But the biggest reason is that FDR consistently believed, and this is why China is in the Security Council right after World War II, he believed that China was a necessary balance, not just to Russian power and German power, but to British power in India. And he was afraid that the Japanese were, were moving in on too much of China. So he consistently imposes sanctions on Japan and, of course, in 1941 initiates the kind of oil embargo on Japan, a kind of embargo we haven't seen anywhere until Iran recently, uh, basically cutting off uh, Japanese access. As we cut off uh, Iranian access to supplies they need for their refineries, cutting off Japanese access to oil, in fact. And he can pretty much do this because the Japanese don't have oil. They get most of their oil from Indonesia and that region, and he can cut off access at sea, the American Navy. Historians have argued, many, that FDR is actually pushing the Japanese into a corner. And he does, to some extent, push them into a corner. I think that's right. I think FDR hopes that by using the sanctions, by condemning the Japanese, he will get the Japanese either to shift policy <coughs> or to initiate a war in Asia that will justify fighting them in that context. The key thing, though, is that's 1941. He's not doing that in 1936, 37. He's leading in that direction. But I think by 19, probably even by 1940, I think he recognizes he's going to have to fight the Japanese, and I think his plan is to fight in Japan first in that region.